Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is Tom Jennings. He is an Emmy and Peabody winning producer and director. And in addition to directing documentaries about the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., the Apollo missions, the Challenger disaster, he also directed 2017's Diana in, his, in her own words. And now, just in time, he is back with a new National Geographic special, Charles, in his own words. It's an intimate, revealing view of the monarch from his own perspective. Active. You can stream it on National Geographic, Hulu, and Disney+. Plus. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I am well. I am really excited about this documentary and about this moment in royal history. You start this story in an interesting moment in Charles's life. You start it with, of all the moments in this 74-year-old man's life, the pen. Why? The leaky pen. Uh, um, well, it, it, it's a long story that I'll make short, but the way this film came about is the National Geographic wanted to do something on Charles. We had done Diana in her own words, and that was very successful for them. Uh, we have a particular style in these films that they like a lot, which is there's no narrator and there are no modern interviews. Uh, for example, with Diana telling you what Diana was like. Instead, for Diana, we were very fortunate to convince Andrew Morton, the British author who wrote the famous book about Diana, to let us use for the first time the tapes that Diana had made that were the foundation for his book. When the Queen passed, uh, Charles becomes king, and we started talking with National Geographic, like, you know, maybe we should consider doing something on Charles. And they weren't quite sure what to do. You know, everything was kind of up in the air. And eventually they decided that they would want to do something in terms of in their own words and uh, the, in the style that we do. And, um, uh, but they didn't want it to be a biography, you know, like this, ha he was born and this happened, this happened, this happened. Um, so we came up with the idea of doing themes and we uh, developed maybe a dozen themes that we could look at in his life. And the main theme that kind of came to the fore as we looked at more and more footage was his relationship with the press and the press relationship with him so in looking at all of the one thing we wanted to do was may also make it feel current or contemporary so in the film there is uh, a series of modern events or current events that allow us to spring back in time uh, to examine the themes that we're talking about. And one is the first one uh, is his relationship with the press. So we chose the leaky pen, <laughs> which went viral and uh, he was uh, kind of ridiculed, you know, unfit to be king, you know, because he loses it over a leaky pen. But we chose that on purpose because who has not experienced, you know, a leaky pen in their pocket, you know, and you look down, it's like, no, <laughs> you know, it wasn't his pocket, but it had leaked all over the place. And the fact that something that we could all relate to, a leaky pen, became headline news and questioned his ability to do his job was a good current example of how everything he does is not only watched but then magnified by a thousand uh that there were other things we could have chosen but that is well known but it also is such a great way to show that nothing escapes the eyes of the world when it comes to king charles and uh, that's how the leaky pen came to lead the show 
uh, the way it does. Well, I think it also gives us the Charles that I think a lot of us think we know, which is maybe, uh, which is that kind of guy who seems unprepared, who hasn't, who has been sheltered his whole life, who doesn't even know what day of the week it is, who blusters over a pen. And yet this is also a man who later on in this same documentary, we see him at a public event where someone ate, fires at him and charges at him. And he is cool as a cucumber, unflappable. Yeah. Yes. And that was another example of uh, his relationship with the press. Uh, I had forgotten that, if I even knew it at all, that someone had taken a shot at him, albeit with a starter pistol. And uh, he was it was in 1994 in Australia, uh, where he was celebrating Australia Day uh, with the people there. And you're correct, he did not flinch, but uh, it's fascinating to watch. It's something that most people probably have forgotten about because it was there and then it was gone. But he did a radio interview, which we found in Australia, right after that, where the reporter says, well, the reports are coming back from London and the uh, UK or England that um, this event, how he did not flinch but under pressure, under the pressure of a firearm, uh, has improved his image. And he goes off on this reporter about, why do you have to say something like this improves my image? You know, if you live in the public eye, sometimes these things happen. And he just berates this reporter for feeding the 24 seven news cycle, which was not as intense as it is here today. But um, it showed that he was well aware of how much scrutiny the press was giving to him all of the time. And something like this, instead of talking about it was tragic that this person had such mental illness that he wanted to attack him or talking about his own personal security. What did the press want to talk about? How being shot at him and that he didn't flinch improved his image. It's just such a bizarre thing to say to someone who's just gone through a relatively traumatic experience like that. So again, we chose it on its face because it's fascinating it's forgotten we have a lot of footage from australia that people had not seen regarding that event and then the reporter uh, asks him something completely unrelated to it he asks him about improving his image by being shot at <laughs> so that's another reason why that one is in there you know, the Charles's relationship with the press forms so much of the spine of of this story. And yet, having also read Prince Harry's book, there is a lot of speculation about what might be going on in the back channels with him and with the royal family. And the that very almost winking, you show him kind of being playful in his adversarial relationship and antagonistic relationship with the press. But there is also this understanding in the UK that there is a relationship with the press as well. What did you discover about that in your research? Uh, <clears throat> about the back channels and relationships with his press, with the press. Um, you know, much like Diana, I think he, Charles is hyper aware uh, that the press is always watching, but he's also hyper aware that the, the press can be used to his advantage. I don't think he's quite as obvious about it as Diana was, but um, there's a lot more there there going on on so many levels that um, it's really, you know, the, the mystery inside the enigma type of thing. Um, I joke that uh, Charles is playing three level chess when the rest of us are playing checkers. Uh, he, despite being portrayed as kind of hapless or befuddled, uh, and he may be at certain times, we all are, I think he plays a very long game where things are concerned, especially with the media, especially with his own family. 
And I think he's looking way over the horizon when we're looking at the uh, ground right in front of us. So uh, I'll give him credit. I have a uh, I have more respect for him. I didn't make this film, you know, to make people like him, but to present him in a way that I don't think most people are aware of his circumstance and background and what has led him to today. Uh, his relationship with Harry, that's uh, that's a film all by itself, obviously, and there's been a lot that's been said uh, of late. We included his relationships with his sons in the film, and uh, but we also juxtaposed it with his relationship with his own father and how he was a great disappointment to Prince Philip. Uh, Philip had sent him to a boarding school in Scotland called Gordonston, which where uh, Charles was mercilessly bullied by classmates and you know put upon, beat up in some cases. Uh, but yet that didn't make him enough of a man for Prince uh, Philip, who was into Charles being a man's man type of guy. Uh, so he sends him down to Australia to a place called Timbertop. Um, in order and and, and um, it's interesting again to juxtapose it with Harry. Uh, uh, Philip had said at the time, "I'm going to put some steel into him, or I just give up." And you know, when you're 15 or 16, that's like a really rough thing to hear from your own father, and your mother is completely distant uh, because she's the Queen of England. So I don't know that he had role models to go off of. Uh, he was nurtured by a guy named Lord Mountbatten, close friend of the family. Um, but to see where he came from, then we show footage of him when the boys are young, kind of playing and roughhousing together. And you look at it and you think, how sad compared to where things stand today. But what's going on in the uh, the headlines with Harry and his relationship, I think you're correct in that that's barely scratching the surface. I think there's a lot more going on behind the scenes. And again, I, I, my opinion is that is part of Charles's long game, whatever that may be in, in regards to his sons. But uh, there's, there's a lot more bubbling underneath uh, of which we're not aware. And even as this documentary points out, even Diana admired Charles as a father, as a parent. Thank you for picking up on that. Yes, we, one of the tricks that we use is um, in telling these stories in order to get uh, commentary from people, uh, some who are no longer living, is that, uh, and I learned this from doing the Diana film, uh, using Andrew Morton's tapes, it turns out uh, almost to the last one we contact that book authors who've written books over the decades about Charles or really about anyone of note, but in this case about Charles, uh, when they interview people for their books, they tape record the interviews and that's for their reference so that they're not misquoting someone so they can listen back and get the uh, the, uh, the the proper context in which things are said. And so we contacted many book authors who've written about Charles over the years. And uh, one of them had a clip from, I believe, a member of parliament as, uh, and you hear from that person as um, uh, Diana's funeral is playing out in our film. And Diana had mentioned to uh, this member of parliament how um, good a father she thought Charles was. And the, uh, the author writing the book asks, well, when did she say that? And the member of parliament responds about six months before she died. So again, there's uh, all this vitriol that goes around regarding Diana's last few months on the planet her relationship with Charles, but yet behind the scenes, 
she had mentioned something that she thought Charles was a good father to her sons. They were still co-parenting. And Charles, in this documentary, talks about being a father of boys, talk, talks about enjoying raising his sons. He is now also a father-in-law to two daughters, very, very different daughters. I want to ask you a little bit about Megan, because she, in so many ways, encapsulates this kind of catalyst, this feeling about the monarchy, this feeling about the the firm, the institution, right? This sense that things have got to change. Yes. I want to know, how has she changed him? And has she changed him? Has she made him dig his heels in more about this institution? Or has he, she helped him maybe think of a different way to move forward as a king? Well, I think just because of the publicity surrounding uh, what Meghan and Harry have uh, been doing the last couple of years, it's probably um, lit a fire under Charles in a sense about uh, having the monarchy evolve, uh, I my my opinion is he knew that the monarchy had to evolve once his mother has passed. And and by the way, just as an aside, what a strange thing for you to get the 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 dream job, the job of uh, anyone's lifetime, the King of England, but you have to wait for your mother to die in order to get it it's, and you have to be 74 years old and correct it's it's a bit of an odd thing i think what's happened i think a lot of the anger and rage that comes from harry um comes in my opinion um i lost my mom when i was very young younger than harry actually and it's a it's not something that is uh really ever goes away and I think that he's always harbored some uh, rage and resentment about anyone and anything having to do with how Diana passed, uh, which would include his father and Camilla. And I think uh, his relationship with Megan has allowed him to express that in a way that perhaps he wouldn't have done before. Um, however, I also, I think Charles probably realized sometime in the last few years that his reign was going to be relatively short compared to his mother's. And again, my opinion after studying him, I think he sees himself as like the hinge person between the old and the new, which will be William. Uh, he is the conduit through which uh, whatever vestiges of the old monarchy they'd like to keep around, you know, certainly the traditions, the things that tourists love, you know, to to uh, stay connected to the past. But I think he going forward, he talks about a slim down monarchy, one that's less bulky, you know, maybe there's going to be a bunch of layoffs. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure how it's going to play out. I think he he knew that had to happen even before uh, Meghan and Harry started doing their uh, their tour on uh, what's wrong with the royal family, and so he's perhaps going to speed that up. But uh, what where I think he's taking it based on all of that is. He wants to, um, you know, he's greatly constrained as the monarch about being involved in politics, for example. And we talk about that. He can't comment on things like global warming anymore. Uh, for the first time in years, because he's now king, he was not allowed to give a speech at the UN Climate Summit, not by his choice, not by the UN's choice, but, you know, the way the monarchy is currently structured. Um, I think the slim down version, you know, the physicality of that will be evident, but over the next couple of years, you're going to see Charles take it in a direction where either he or his son, when he becomes king, will be able to stand on the floor of parliament and talk about global warming. I see it becoming more political in that sense. Um, and I think that's where he always wanted it to be. Whether he's successful or not, I don't know. 
And I think the relationship with Megan and kind of holding uh, the firm's feet to the fire, uh, if it's done anything, it's probably accelerated uh, the process in his, in his own mind about how quickly that needs to be done. And when we know how unpopular the monarchy is and that the majority of his subjects don't approve of the monarchy, he still has a much higher approval rating than he did 30 years ago when it was 4%. 4%. I mean, who gets 4% from approval ratings? Well, I think Gallup stomach poll. flu could get a higher approval rating than Prince Charles in 1993. That's like, <laughs> un, like what even is that number? I, that was shocking, I have to say, when we kind of dug up that. I, I had our, our researchers who worked so very hard on I said, I, I made them check it three times. I said, yeah, you know, get another source. You know, I used, I was a journalist when I uh, first graduated from college, a print journalist. And, you know, there's the old adage that if your mother says she loves you, get a second source. You know, so I said 4% approval rating for then Prince Charles. You get three sources on that to make sure it's right. And yes, uh, he's still very popular. He is now popular now. Uh, the fallout from the breakup with Diana, who uh, Diana was so popular. Um, it's understandable how his approval rating would go down, but down to 4%, that's almost uh, something you cannot recover from. But he plays the long game. He has recovered from it. Uh, they, think about the fact that one thing I did not know, you probably know this, but I did not know that he and Camilla dated when they were single in 1970. Okay, first of all, I guess you haven't seen The Crown. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> but yes. I, the, the fact that they were dating and that, um, and that because they did what young people do when they're in love, they had an intimate relationship, disqualified her from being becoming marrying charles becoming queen that was in 1970 well 53 years later charles is going to become king he's married to camilla and she's going to be queen he that's that's an example of his long game to me i mean it took 53 years for all of that to come to pass, but he kept going. He's getting, he's getting all, he's getting everything. He's getting every piece of the Get everything you ever wanted. I, I want to ask you one more question because we're talking about Camilla. You spend yes. a good amount of time on probably the most famous few words Charles has ever said in his life. Yes. Three words, right? Whatever love Whatever means. Love means. <laughs> Yes. Ouch. I mean, ouch. Yes. It's the last ouch. thing you want your fiance to say about love. And yet, this is a man who has had a 50 plus love affair with one particular woman. He does know what love means. He is married to, as as is pointed out in this documentary, Charles is married to his soulmate. He knows what love means, right? He does know what love means. And uh, he was well aware, I believe, you know, when he uttered those words, whatever love means, you, I mean, you could really extrapolate that out to be, well, this is love under the current constraints in which I live. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was a heinous thing to say. And I've, I liked how our, uh, our, it was a very conscious decision, obviously, how our editors um, used every frame of the cameras continuing to roll. Because as you know, that clip is shown a lot, but it's often cut off after you see Diana say, yeah, oh, thank you very much, you know, because the reporter has to explain what love means. And they both kind of say, thank you, thank you. And she looks down. But then we stop and say, but most people don't realize how long the camera stayed on Diana. And you just, the look down continues and you just see this expression of 
despair and horror, I think would be a good way to describe it. And um, she's completely defeated but in that moment. Tom, that look is also on Charles's face as well. When I saw that clip, I saw the despair on his face as well. I saw two people looking away from each other in abject despair. I agree. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, it's it's much easier to follow Diana's gaze, you know, because she, I mean, she described herself as the lamb to the sl slaughter, and it was obvious that was what was going on. Uh, and it was part of how the institution worked. It was what they needed. And she was the person in line uh, available to do that. Uh, yeah, whatever love means, I think, will be something that will haunt him forever in many ways. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned the anti-monarchists, if I could respond to that. Uh, that there's a tremendous anti-monarchist movement because people are thinking, well, what do we really need them for? You know, we don't live in a fiefdom anymore. You know, it's not a role to like to till the soil and then present the king with our best sheep, you know, that it just doesn't work that way. Um, and he's well aware of that, too. I think that's why you're going to start to see changes soon. And they will be subtle and subtle and subtle. And then you and I will talk in five years and we'll say, wow, look what he pulled off right under our noses little by little. But uh, one of the ways that we got into that was uh, showing the anti-monarchists who were protesting after the queen, because there were people who believed once Elizabeth died, that was going to be it. Uh, Charles would say, you know, this is, uh, why don't we just let this fade into the sunset? But uh, he has no intention of doing that. However, when he was 19 and uh, went through this process called the investiture to become uh, Prince of Wales, uh, he walked right into these riotous crowds up in Wales and charmed them, uh, which is a remarkable thing at 19. I mean, who at 19 is able to, I, I wasn't calming riotous crowds when I was 19 years old. You know, I, I, I could barely get to my class in college on time. And not only does he do that, but then he... Uh, then he he goes on this like tour. Well, he first learns the language. He spends two months in a university up there learning the history of the place. He tours Wales. I love that uh, inter where he interviews an old farmer in Wales. I mean, that's very rare stuff. And we loved having it. And then he goes on this like grand tour of Wales where he's meeting people. And he meets a bunch of young people who are out planting trees and they're talking about the environment. And at 19, that's where his passion for environmental issues was ignited in Wales. And again, here we are all these years later, and it's probably his number one issue outside of family problems. It's his number one kind of global issue about climate change and global warming. And that started at 19. And it's, it, it's again, part of his long game of doing things. And I think we're going to see more and more of that play out. He is, uh, Charles is nothing if not a very patient man, which uh, cannot, uh, cannot be anything but an asset if you're going to be the king of England, as he now is. Tom, uh, you said we're going to talk again in five years. I'm going to hold you to it. Maybe we could even right. try to make it earlier than that. Tom Jennings, thank you so much for talking to me today. The show, once again, is called Charles in His Own Words, and you can watch it on National Geographic, Hulu, and Disney+. Plus. Thank you so much, Tom. Happy coronation. Happy coronation to you.